Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is J.R. Moore coming to you live from deep in the mountains of the Missouri Ozarks. On Monday, the 18th day of September, year of our Lord, 2017, welcome to the John Moore Show. Proper tip of the day, I want to encourage all of you, if you don't have one, to get yourself a mechanical and automatic wristwatch. They're called automatic wristwatch. It does not have a battery, so EMP won't affect it, and you don't need to worry about changing batteries. There are a couple of selections at my website at thelibertyman.com under John's Survival and Tactical Gear. One I'm looking at right now is the Invicta Pro Diver. It's uh, less than $80, and it's uh, shipping included if you're a Prime member uh, with Amazon. And um, pretty nice watch. Looks uh, very similar to my Rolex Submariner uh, for about a little more than 1% of the price of a Rolex. Uh, so... Uh, a wristwatch that is not subject to EMP would be a good thing to have in a, in a grid-down tactical situation. So you need to check that out. Also, before we get to our special guest, uh, please pray for my hometown, St. Louis. Last night was the third night of violence in the city of St. Louis. No no fatality so far. The, the uh, demonstrations last night were the biggest and worst of the three days. A uh, 1,000 people out in the streets, 80 people arrested. Uh, some property damage. And um, I was hoping this would be over Saturday night, but uh, once it went into Sunday, uh, all bets are off. The uh, protesters are well organized, uh, and uh, they've been hitting multiple locations at the same time to keep the police uh, uh, running hither hither and yon, trying to keep up with uh, the various protests in shopping malls and uh, intersections of streets and uh, attempting to shut down interstate highways. So please pray for our hometown, St. Louis, my hometown, St. Louis, that it, they will get through this with no uh, serious property damage, no loss of life. We have patient Wendy Greenroom, my friend Jimmy Jensling. Jimmy is the proprietor, the CEO of Desert Eagle Shooters. That website is deserteagleshooters.com. We're going to talk about matters related to firearms and the gun culture. Uh, good morning, Jimmy. Good morning, sir. And, yes, been... Uh praying for your community uh actually when i first heard about the uh the out here in new mexico the first news that we got was that the judge was about to make a uh, decision and uh anytime i hear those words i sit there and i kind of cringe but uh you know we were hoping for peace and understanding and and things like that and just it of course it doesn't happen of course not uh, of course not. Well, these agitators are probably being paid by George Soros, probably received training from Soros-related trainers. Uh, I haven't – I got one update Saturday. I'll be getting another one a day or so from somebody who has inside information on this. Uh, but it could get much worse if the Soros people choose it to get worse, and we shall see. Oh, man. Well, that You know, that we had a gun show in Alamogordo this weekend, and uh, – very fruitful, a lot of fun. Uh, that That is one gun show that is kind of like old home week for me. Uh, and I say that in a, with a tongue-in-cheek because uh, that was the second gun show that Teresa and I ever did when we started doing the gun show circuit. And uh, a lot of vendors there and everything giving us tips, realizing we were new, and, uh, you know, commenting on this, commenting on that, and, you know, friendly critique and, and friendly information. And uh, it was it was an interesting conversation for the whole thing because it, it went to St. Louis. Uh, it went to self-defense. Uh, I had several people looking at body armor and others looking at uh, different ways of carrying uh, extra magazines and such, and I had one gentleman ask me, he says, you know, well, I see that you carry, you know, your pistol in a cross draw, you know, why? And I explained to him, well, my arms are too long. Uh, if you had carried on a belt, uh, any kind of like that on the right side, since I'm a right-handed person, it's, it is an extra motion for me to pull that thing up to clear and demonstrated, you know, cross draw, and he sat there and started thinking about it, so... You know, the fun part about gun shows is it's education on both sides. Right. We get educated, we get educated by people with questions, uh, 
and and comments about what we carry, and then we in turn get to educate some people because of questions they ask us about how or why we do something. Right. Well, another and, advantage uh, of cross another advantage of cross draw is when you're in a seated position, whether in a restaurant or, or in a motor vehicle, uh, it's far easier than than a strong side uh, draw. Exactly. <laughs> Which in, in a in a seated position where you've got the seat back behind you, uh, wider than your body, uh, there's no place for your elbow to go. So it's difficult. No, and and in you know, he was he was looking at my holster, and was you know, just trying to figure out how he could do that. And I says, well, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. You can actually, some manufacturers uh, will sell left and right-handed holsters. And uh, if you look at them and find one you like, look, if you're right-handed, look at a left-handed holster. And if you put it on the right side, depending on how the holster is designed, it can become a cross draw for a right-handed person. And just different conversations on stuff like that. And then I had another gentleman ask me, you know, well, how come you carry three extra magazines? And... I, I sit there, and I know why, and it had been a long time since I'd been asked that question, and I looked at him, and I said, uh, mall shootings. And he looked at me and goes, what? And I says, if I'm in a mall or if I'm uh, in a heavily populated area or whatever, and we get a mass shooter come out, I says, I can guarantee you, as good as I think I am, I'm not going to hit him the first time. And I said, there's going to be a lot of things come, you know, into play. So I would much rather have, you know, three full magazines when it's all over, if I was ever in that situation, than to have one empty one and wishing I had a second. Um, so different conversations here and there, and um, we... Uh, Something I'd like to talk to you about a little bit today, and I'm going to need some input from you because of where you are and your teaching. But uh, with what's going on in St. Louis, and we know it's going to spread, it's already starting to spread. There were uh, reports we were listening to on the radio coming home of incidents in Dallas, uh, Fort Worth area, related to this uh, St. Louis story. And... Uh, of course, Chicago's got incidents related to this story, riots and things. And you and I both know with the organizers doing their part, it's going to spread and they're going to use it to the full extent that they can. And I'm, I'm sorry, folks. Someone tries to run over a cop and leads them on a high-speed chase and gets shot at the end of it. I don't feel for them. You know, well, they say stop. It wasn't, stop. it wasn't just a someone. He was a convicted heroin dealer. Right. And, well, I was, you know, even if it was just a someone, they do that and, and you know, try to run over a cop, hit a police car, high-speed chase. When it comes down to the end, if they get shot, I am sorry. I don't, I don't have any remorse for them. Even if you are a convicted felon, if the cop says stop and there's more than one of them, listen, I would rather, you know, this person take his chances in court right. than, well, put, the, you know, let me give you a little individuals in danger. Let me give you a little help here. Let me give you a little help here, Jimmy. The, yes, sir. The prosecuting attorney uh, did what they did uh, to prosecute this man, knowing that they wanted a certain outcome. Now, I've been part of uh, quite a few, uh, well, hundreds of criminal matters. A uh, prosecutor has a lot of discretion, complete discretion on what to charge somebody with. Now, they could have, char they could have chosen to charge this man with, um, I should say, what they asked. I got this backwards. Uh, they have their choice of what they put in the pleadings in terms of the giving the judge, there was no jury in this case, giving the judge options in terms of what to find the man guilty or innocent of. They chose to only give the judge one option that was guilty or not guilty of, of first-degree murder, which is premeditated murder. 
What they could have done, and they did not, they did not do, was give the judge go, give the judge the option of second degree murder or manslaughter, which uh, what the judge may have found the man guilty, the police officer guilty of manslaughter, or, uh, but that was not an option. the uh, The burden of proof for first degree murder, premeditated murder, is a very high standard, and it's meant to be, and it should be. The circumstances did not meet that standard for first degree murder for this uh, former police officer. Therefore, the judge found the man not guilty, and that, that's what the pro- that's what the prosecutor wanted. They wanted this man to walk. They wanted this police officer to walk away from this thing with no conviction. Second degree murder is a lower standard, and manslaughter is uh, a fairly uh, low hurdle to overcome for a conviction. But uh, those weren't those were not options for the judge, so the judge had basically no choice under those circumstances but to uh, find the, the uh, officer, the, the former officer, not guilty. That's what the prosecutor wanted. Now, mm-hmm. if you know how the system works, that, that I, and I do, since I've been part of it for 40 years, I know exactly what the prosecutor did, why they did it, and uh, they they achieved their goal. And uh, right. I say that that's a good outcome. And, well, we were listening uh, to it on the way over to the gun shows uh, Friday. And Teresa, I can't remember what how she worded it, but she was basically questioning um, if he did something wrong and everything, couldn't the prosecutor have, have proven it? Because, you know, we're getting all the second and third and fourth hand in the opinion on news. And uh, I told her, I says, because the prosecutor wanted him to get off. Because of, like you just stated, you know, first degree murder means that he planned to do this before he ever pulled the guy over. That's where it would have to start. Right. And uh, she then she understood totally, and she goes, well, why did they charge him with that and nothing else? And I says, because they wanted him off. The cop did nothing wrong. Right. And right. Uh, that was the only way that they could have a trial and ensure that he was going to walk. Right. And uh, then, you know, my wife's a smart cookie, and she sat there and she goes, well, it sounds like they knew that the cop was protecting himself. And I said, exactly. They knew the situation. I mean, it was all over police scanners. People had recorded stuff when they were going. So everybody knew what was going on. And uh, that's how some of the conversations went at the gun show this weekend. And uh, we had one person that was, uh, we were discussing it, and this guy was listening, and he goes, well, what, you know, say you're the person, not not the police officer, but you're just, you or me, and some situation like this comes up, and uh, you're threatened like that. He says, what do you do? And I says, the first thing I would do is I would be thankful that I had insurance. And I explained to him, I says, look, I says, anybody that carries a handgun for protection or owns a handgun at the house for protection or anything else should really have insurance like the second call defense insurance because no matter what happens there's going to be civil cases now against this cop and if they haven't already been filed and started they're going I to be no, they're, well they won't because the, the parents of the deceased uh, were compensated already the um uh, "Quote unquote," fiance has no standing, really, uh, and that's you know that, that's not going to happen. I think this, I think it's over as far as any legal process. Okay, I was not aware of that. Right, but uh, yeah. I, I and that's another problem with our nation now. Why do you compensate the family of a crook? Uh, another whole show, uh, probably one that could go for a year. But if if an individual has to, even in your own home, um, even on your own front porch. There's a couple of cases out there right now. Um, retired military. His daughter uh, had dated a kid and come to find out he was the ultimate sleaze bag, and she broke it off. And the kid and a couple of his friends came to their house demanding that she go out on a date with them. And the father got involved. And the kid threw a punch, and the other one pulled a knife, and the dad shot two of them, I think, 
and the third one ran, and they're prosecuting the dad um, for attempted murder. Yep. And the you know they had a security system in this particular instance, so everything was on the on the video. Right. And they're still having to go through the court costs and all this other crap. Oh yes. And the insurance. Uh, I learned something out um, talking to one of our customers that is going to change um, this new uh, NRA um, carry guard insurance. I learned something about that, John. That's very disturbing. The uh, with the second call defense, they pick up all of the all of the legal fees from day one. And all of the lawyers that are in their network are uh, firearms lawyers. You know, they're pro Second Amendment, they're they're pro gun owner, and they've tried many of these cases. I learned something about that new carry guard that you're in an instance and you call the number and they give you a number of attorneys in your area. They haven't vetted these people so they're not really sure exactly what their expertise is. But they say, okay, here's $50,000 for your attorney. And right there, and this guy looked, showed me in his paperwork, that's all he gets until the trial is over. That, that's with this new insurance uh, that, that NRA's got. You get fifty thousand dollars. That's to cover the retainer on your attorney, uh, expert witnesses, uh, court filing fees, subpoena fees, whatever else is in. That's all they get until the case is adjudicated. And then what and happens? Then, and if he is acquitted, then the insurance pays everything off. If it is a hung jury, or um, what's the other one? Um, anyway, if he is not uh, uh, hold that found thought. Hold that, hold that. Hold that thought, Jimmy. We got a break. We'll be right back. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, J.R. Moore here. It's taken three years before I could offer the inter-shelter domes for sale. During those three years, several different governments and militaries were taking all their production. The inter-shelter dome homes may be just what you've been looking for to provide affordable, energy-efficient, permanent, and attractive housing. These dome homes are prefabricated units that can be assembled in a few hours by two men with a ladder and simple hand tools. Check out the photos of these dome homes built in the Arctic, on tropical beaches, in suburban areas, and in forests. All the details... Many photographs and the pricing of the dome homes are listed on the left-hand side of my homepage at thelibertyman.com. I think you'll find these homes are not only attractive, but they're energy efficient and a bonus. You can disassemble them and reassemble them as many times as you feel you need the need to. Pretty great, huh? Something that's very, very unique. Check them out at my website at thelibertyman.com. We're back. J.R. Moore here on Monday, the 18th of September. Before the break, Jimmy, you were talking about the uh, it's NRA insurance and your and your thoughts on and the comments on uh, the payout schedule that they've got set up. Let's go. Let's finish up that thought. Jimmy, take it off mute. Hello. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, that's my one time for the day. Um. This gentleman was talking to me about it and everything, and he was looking for an alternate insurance. So we gave him the sheets on ours. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to see what we're talking about, you can go to my webpage, DesertEagleShooters.com. 
on the left side, there is a uh, little banner. It says Second Call Defense, and you can click on that and uh, go to uh, the web page there. It'll take you right over to Second Call Defense, and you can look at the different programs and everything. And affordable is an understatement. Uh, it really is. But anyway, getting back to this gentleman, um, he was looking at it and everything, and the only way that they pick up the rest of the tab for, in, for this court case and everything, it states that when you are acquitted, and that kind of confused him, so he called the, the phone number on it, the, the customer service line, and talked to him, and it says it finally about three or four people have finally got someone that was knowledgeable that could explain it to him. And the only thing that he was entitled to was the limit of his coverage uh, in it. And if it went over that, it was his responsibility to take care of anything that went over his limit. And the other thing was he had to be acquitted. And he said that the person he was talking to was very, very good because um, he would question him about it, and he says, well, yeah, as soon as you're, you know, when you're quitted, the attorney sends all the bills and everything to us, and the insurance takes care of it and all, and when you're quitted, and when you're quitted, and he asked the guy point blank, and he says, well, what happens if it uh, is a hung jury or, uh, I'm trying to think of the other one, or dismissed. That's what it was. If it was a hung jury or if it was just dismissed. And he goes, well, then you got your bills and everything. It's not covered. And this really? guy, he's, yeah. And and I'm like, you're serious about that? He goes, yeah. He says, that's why I canceled it. And uh, he says, I may should have gotten something before uh, I canceled it and then canceled it. He says, I canceled it right there. And uh, he took our information, is going to go home and look at it. But uh, it really, really surprised me with all of this hoopla that they're putting out on the news and at the uh, NRA convention where Second Call Defense and USCCA both had booths uh, every year at that since they were launching the carry guard they canceled uh, Second Call Defense USCCA and I think there was a couple of others uh, smaller companies they just canceled their booths and says no we don't need you we've got our own now and uh, well, that's but, a good way to guarantee monopoly, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And uh, all the uh, second, if you notice, and I don't get uh, any of the NRA magazines, haven't for years. Uh, let my my membership lapse, which I do need to get that back up. But uh, from what I understand, there no longer is any USCCA uh, advertisements or second call defense or anybody else's insurance advertisements in any of the NRA magazines. Uh, again, I think that's very stupid. But, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you are going to carry for home protection, for protection when you travel, um, uh, if you're at home, uh, well, that's something I'll talk about in a little bit. Really seriously look into the insurance, even if it's just the very basic model, and I think that's like around $14 a month or whatever for individual. Um, take a good look at it, because if you're, let's, let's say it's a justifiable shooting from the word go, guaranteed if the person dies or is seriously injured, the crook's family is going to sue you. And... They think it's their right. Even though their kid was a piece of dirt, they're going to sue you. So something to look at, something to just, you know, very seriously consider and discuss with your family, uh, your spouse, and look at very seriously. Because what's going on there in St. Louis right now, um, no telling when any of those individuals are going to have to defend themselves. And all that's going to do is add fuel for the fire for the other side. Right. And well, the, the protesters have avoided the Asian business district because the Asians are known to defend their businesses. Uh, they've, uh, so hopefully that will continue. we got a break. 
call number is 800-313-9443. You are tuned in to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Visit our website by going to republicbroadcasting.org. Ladies and gentlemen, J.R. Moore here. I've worked with men and women involved in the high-end shelters for years. With the Ozark Survival Homesteads, you get things you don't get with the high-end shelters. You get a opportunity to be in the bunker, of course. You also get a home, a 60 by 90 lot. You get your storable food, uh, your livestock share, your garden, your greenhouse share, your seed bank share. One person to have everything they need, right at $25,000. For a family of three, $37,000. You really need to check this out. It's very unique. At my website, you'll see the uh, Ozark Survival Homesteads on the left side of my homepage. Go there, read that one page, fill out the form with your name, your email address, and your telephone number, and I will forward that to the guys and gals at the Ozark Survival Homesteads. Check it out. You'll be very glad you did. Thank you very much. All right. We are back with John Moore back. J.R. Moore here on Monday, the 18th of September. My website is thelibertyman.com. That's the libertyman.com. I was going through the list of things listed under John Survival and Tactical Gear. I, I'd forgotten how extensive that list is. Um, a lot of things are that you may not know even exist. You need to check that out. John's Survival and Tactical Gear at my website, thelibertyman.com. Of course, we have Jim Mechanics water filters there just below the spinning globe. Uh, these are Jim's proprietary water filters that he has manufactured. And last but not least, the energy cleaner. This is my home business. If you place an order, I'm the guy that boxes them up and ships them. If you get a mattress pad, I'm the guy that reconfigures them and ships them also. I'm shipping two energy cleaners to Australia this morning. And um, picking up some more from Tom Burhill the next day or so. So if you want to get a great night's sleep, get yourself an energy cleaner. If you've got arthritis pain, yes, indeed, get yourself an energy cleaner. Joint pain, back pain, get yourself an energy cleaner. Only $285, shipping included to American zip codes. Keep in mind, I offer for me to you personally a 30-day money-back guarantee. Also, I take PayPal as well as MasterCard and Visa. If you need to spread out the payments, PayPal now takes payments. If you live in the United States, they do. Checks can be sent to my address at thelibertyman.com. Toll free hour line 24 hours a day for energy cleaners and mattress pads. Here it is, 800-592-9543. I say again, 800-592-9543. Visiting with Jimmy Jensling with Desert Eagle Shooters. That's DesertEagleShooters.com. There's a link on my, on my link page at TheLibertyMan.com. Well, Jimmy, I, I don't want to spend too, too much more time on this insurance thing. It's obviously something people need to look at and consider. I've... Uh, Worked a number of cases where if people, if, if one gentleman in particular had uh, insurance that would have helped, it turned out his homeowner's insurance kicked in and took care of some very expensive legal fees where he uh, was shooting at three men that were attempting to steal, rustle, uh, steal his cattle and um, had a good outcome. We won both the criminal case and the civil case. And uh, it's a tough situation to be in, isn't it, Jimmy? Oh, yes, sir. And um, that is uh, another point there that you uh, that came up in the discussions and everything. Uh, when to use it? And uh, this guy was discussing it. Uh, another person behind him uh, asked, you know, well, when can you and be justified? His daughter. Uh, the only thing that really saved her was that she had a GoPro, uh, not a GoPro, but a dash cam in her car that had the audio on, and this guy attempted to carjack her and uh, busted out the window on her car, tried to pull her out, 
and she got picked up by the police for brandishing because when she pulled the, her handgun out from wherever it was, of course, the guy lets go and runs and then calls the police and tells them he was panhandling and she pulled up and pointed a gun at him. Right, right. Um, that was stupid on his part. Yeah. Yes. But, ladies and gentlemen, if you're protecting life, you can use deadly force. If they're stealing your stuff, you can't. That is my best understanding on it. Is that That's pretty much correct. Right, John? Um. You can use deadly force to protect human life, not to protect property. Right. And uh, um, now, so, but, but, and, but here's but here's something where a lot of, there's a nuance here that people need to know. And, and I, uh, in my front of my class, I'll hold up a revolver and I'll point it at the wall, and I say, "This is this is this is a physical force." When I point the pistol at the wall and I squeeze the trigger, that's deadly force. Physical force. Deadly force. Up to the moment you you pull squeeze the trigger on that firearm, it's physical force. The moment you pull the trigger, it's deadly force. Exactly. And, and, it, and it's it's a huge huge difference in terms of how the law views your actions. Uh huh. And um, just just research it a little bit, ladies and gentlemen. That's all I wanted to bring up because what's going on in Johnstown and everything could very easily pop up in your own. Um, the, uh, the the better you're prepared on it, the, the better things are going to turn out. Um, another thing at the gun show that we had a lot of interest in and talking about was reloading. Uh, several people uh, thinking on getting into reloading and discussing things with them on that. Night Vision was another biggie uh, at this show. And uh, then, of course, like I said earlier, the body armor. So... This is one of those shows that it really covered the gamut with our customers and everything and uh, the folks that were at the show as far as interests and questions. And uh, we got to discussing one point on it, black powder rifles and things, and I was listening to a gentleman uh, in his 80s that uh, uh, World War II vet and end of World War II, uh, he actually showed up in in Europe just in time to come home. Uh, Good for him. But uh, he was discussing that how when he was raised, even though they had all the centerfire weapons around and everything, his father and his grandfather always had a flintlock rifle around for the simple fact that the only thing that you needed was powder and ball, and you could make the powder if necessary or find somebody that did. So um, it was quite entertaining to, to listen to him talk because uh, just just started discussing things, and we had a larger and larger crowd just kind of listening in. All right. So All right. We got a caller here. We got Rick in Missouri. Good morning, Rick. Good morning, Rick. Hey, John, good morning, today? Jimmy. Oh yeah. Well, I, I'm going to guess USPS being what it is. You do not have my money yet. Uh, might might be today, but but the package is ready to yeah. go. Yeah, sure. All right, good. Um, when I was young, uh, I discovered uh, the, we didn't have you know all of our toys were generally broken you know by uh, February. So uh, I saw in an encyclopedia how to make black powder, and I realized that um, all I had to do was walk a couple blocks to the uh, uh, pharmacy, and I could get everything I needed except. We didn't know what to do with charcoal, so we were grinding briquettes, which worked just fine. And uh, one day I was over on the side of the house, and I was uh, making some, and I was making it on a, a patio block, and I was using another patio block to smash <laughs> to smash the stuff. I see so where this is going. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, lo and behold, you know, I didn't have to light it. It just, you know, went off all by itself. And um, this tremendous white cloud uh, came around the side of the house, went around the front of the house, and my father came flying out, and I thought I was going to get killed. And uh, he said, uh, looks like you got it right this time. <laughs> I said, uh, yes, yes, sir. And then he took my patio block. I couldn't believe it. Um, so um, anyway, uh, 
the uh, what I wanted to say, and it's, I, I don't want to take that conversation backward. Uh, I'm just going to do it quick and get off of it. Uh, the the situation here around St. Louis is interesting. <clears throat> everybody from everybody from North County, which you know, in my case, would be Ferguson, Florissant, and all those areas. Uh, we're pretty much done with the subject of race, but I mean, we're all just beat to death with that nonsense. But um, it is interesting to note that uh, a couple days ago, these people were massing at the intersection of Highway 70 and Highway 79, which would be a highway between that goes from St. Louis to Kansas City, Missouri. And if you get outside of St. Louis a little bit and into the West County area, there's a highway that goes north, Highway 79, and it goes up toward Hannibal. Uh, I wouldn't say this is rural, but it certainly is the highway to the rural area. Um, they were the uh, these these uh, Black Lives Matter types, and were were massing at the intersection, which brings up the only point that I want to make about this, and that is that you know if you think for one minute, you all you people out there in Radio Land, if you think for one minute our local African Americans are inventing these things, uh, you've got another thing coming. This is being orchestrated by a group who who is obviously looking to cause uh, civil disturbance because if you take your nonsense to these predominantly, um, these these are areas where whites, if I'm allowed to use that term, ran after they were overrun and victimized in North County. They ran there. And they're a little touchy, and they're just, they, they, and the, I mean, if you want to cause a problem by chasing them down, uh, you are exacerbating uh, an already touchy situation. So I think that's what they're doing, and I, somebody knows they're doing it, and uh, so that's kind of all I wanted to say about that. Now, once we get through the, I'm just going to change the subject back a second, but once we get through this um, site situation, I still want to talk to you about the uh, night vision. I know we brought that up, and uh, I'm not finished with that at all. Um, so anyway, uh, interesting show. Once again, I, I've been recommending this to all my friends who um, who enjoy the firearms thing, and I, I know that there's a bunch of guys right now that I know who like to dial in on Monday morning and listen to you guys. So I appreciate this format, by the way. Okay. Well, we're go- we wouldn't be anything without the callers and the listeners. Uh, ah, it's, well, it would still be an interesting <laughs> conversation, even if it was just coffee. But, okay, well, thanks a million. Okay, thank All you. Right. We appreciate the call. Sure. All right. Oh, Take all care. Right. I learned an interesting fact about uh, St. Louis this morning on the news, John, I didn't know. Really? Up What's until, that? until uh, about, I, I can't remember the exact number of years they said, but we'll just suffice to say that used to, there were something like... Uh, 30, 25 or 30 of the Fortune 500 companies were based in St. Louis. And because of the way politics and crime and everything as else goes, it's now down to something like eight or nine. Um, just packing up and leaving because they couldn't stand, the, I guess, the politics and the crime both. But, well, uh, it's... St. Louis, uh, I don't want to get into a long discourse on the nuances of the, the metro St. Louis area. Um, but um, I, I know that in the city itself, uh, there's, they've been run by Democrats for decades, uh, corrupt Democrats, where frequently in many polling places more ballots come out than people come in the door to vote. Uh, and <laughs> I know this firsthand. Um, and... Um, the uh, uh, they, they do they got minimum wage laws that, that, that run business out of town, uh, unions that run business out of town, right to work that runs businesses out of town. Uh, very in, in some ways the city itself is very anti-business, and uh, that's that's a great reason for a business to leave or decide not to go there in the first place. Incredible. But let's get back. To, Let's get back to uh, firearms. I, I think that's why people yeah. are listening this morning, not to hear about the issues of St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, 
Let's talk a little about, about the proper cleaning and maintenance of these firearms and uh, what products that we like to use. I, I got a couple I like to use. How about you? Oh, yeah. Well, the, we, the one that we uh, like to use, we wound up selling, uh, and that was the Frog Lube. Uh, there are a lot of good cleaners and products out there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if, you're, if you have a product that uh, right now about, I'd guess, probably 80% of people, if you ask them what they use to clean their gun with, it would be Hoppy's number nine. Right. And right. Uh, that has been the industry standard, uh, my goodness, since before the turn of the century, I believe. And um, the interesting well, the turn story of the on it. Only- 19, only the turn of the century was only 17 years ago. Uh, well, let's let's say uh, eight, uh, early 1900s. Okay. Uh, I'm still living in the past, John. I haven't woke up yet. Okay. Um, but um, the uh, interesting story that I heard about the number nine was that uh, the Hoppy's company was working on a government contract for a uh, water displacing. Uh, firearms and gun cleaning uh, formula, decarbon, protect the metal, and everything else. And this was the ninth formula of something like 25 that actually met all the specs for government. Right, right. So, uh, just well, a little you know side note. Yeah. Well, you know you're a real gun guy if you were Hoppy's number nine is cologne. Yes, yes. And, That's right. uh, But now that's changing because if you carry frog lube and use frog lube and everything, then you you smell like a York peppermint patty. Uh huh. Um, And and that draws the ladies, you know, very quickly just just to find out where you're hiding the the patty. But uh, um, there's two products I like to use. One one is for deep cleaning. It's called JB. That's Juno Bravo, um, non-embedding bore cleaning compound. You don't use that all the time, but uh, occasionally to get the 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 bore really nice and clean and then sweets 762 solvent or is another good cleaning product i haven't and, seen uh, sweets here in a long time and, and uh for general lubrication uh my friend sam andrews who builds rifles for the swat teams and and the various uh government agencies um mobile number mobile uh, uh mobile one mobile one uh zero w30 um uh, automobile oil is what it is, um, mm-hmm. synthetic 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 oil, which uh, a quarter of that would probably last you decades, uh, I'm sure, unless you're um, cleaning a lot of guns for other people. Uh, right. So my now, my grandson will be getting a quarter of that along with his AR-15 uh, for his 21st birthday here coming up. <laughs> well, one one thing about cleaning your guns, ladies and gentlemen, uh, more so handguns than it is uh, uh, rifles. It's a good point whenever you, you're going through and cleaning your guns and everything to take a uh, flashlight or a mirror uh, to reflect light into your bore and look at the condition of the rifling and everything in it. And a lot of times, oh, half to three-quarters to the end of the muzzle, you'll see streaking in there. And on handguns, well, if you're shooting cast bullets or just regular lead bullets in a rifle, you'll see the exact same thing. Right. That is lead deposits in that is getting in your, uh, building up on your rifling and everything, and it truly does affect your accuracy and the performance of your gun. And uh, so if everybody's got a pen and paper handy, if you're not, go get one, because after the next break, I'm going to give you Uncle Jimmy's and Desert Eagle's formula for cleaning lead out of your barrel, and it's done with household components and is very, very effective and is basically the exact same thing that you spend high dollar for in a bottle at the gun shop. Okay, here's our break. We'll get that after the break. Hold on, hold on. We'll be right back. Back, 
J.R. Moore here on Monday, the 18th of September, visiting with Jimmy Jensling with Desert Eagle Shooters. That's DesertEagleShooters.com. Well, Jimmy, you got a home recipe for uh, getting the lead out. Let's hear about this. Well, I've been using this for ever since I was a kid. My dad taught it to my brother and myself. Two common home cleaners that you've got in your uh, under your sink or something, maybe in the pantry. One is bleach. Uh, excuse me. One is vinegar, and the other is ammonia. Now you're going to take a plastic jug, uh, bottle, whatever you're going to use, and mix um, 50/50 of ammonia and vinegar. So one cup of ammonia, one cup of vinegar uh, in there will last you a long time. Uh, keep it out of any sunlight. Whenever you mix this up, store it in a in a cool, dark place, mainly dark. Uh, because it will react to sunlight over time. Take and plug the muzzle end of your barrel, and uh, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. You can drive a cork in there. Uh, you can take a lead bullet and tap it into the end. What you want to do is get something that will engage the rifling and the bore and seal it so that uh, your deleading compound cannot come out. Then... Fabricate away. I've used books. Uh, I've used a bench vise with a rag wrapped around the gun uh, or whatever. But position your barrel so that the chamber end of it is pointed up. And then very cautiously, you don't want to get this all over the gun, uh, very cautiously use a funnel or whatever and trickle that into your bore until you fill it all the way up to the top. And then just watch it for a few minutes. Make sure it's not going to dribble over on anything. And then let it work for about 30 minutes. When you go to look at it again, take a flashlight and shine on the top of the fluid, and you'll see this like a gray cloud on the top of it, right. some, depending on how much uh, lead you've got in your barrel. But that is the lead that it's removing down there. The ammonia and the vinegar both work together as acids, but it will dissolve lead. And you get that done, let it set for about 30 minutes, take the rifle or the pistol out, dump that off to the side. This is where John's Mobile One comes in handy. Have a rag with that saturated with it and immediately wipe off any metal that it's, this stuff has gotten on because it will corrode it like crazy. And depending on the amount of leading, you may have to do this a couple of times. But what you want to look for is when you look at it after 30 minutes, no cloud on top. And if it's really bad, you can sit there and after the first application, pull the plug out of the end, run a copper brush back and forth, through the bore a couple of times to loosen up anything else that's in there, put the plug back in and do it again. Handguns, sometimes you'll do this four or five times if, if you've never really deep scrubbed that barrel and to get, to get all of that lead out of it. Now, once you've done this and you've got all the lead out and you're cleaned up and it's ready to go back in the gun safe or whatever, Take your Hoppies number 9, your Frog Lube, your Sweets, whatever it is that you use, and run a patch through there four or five times, a snug-fitting patch. Make sure you're not getting any residue or anything on the patch. Take and run the brush through it a couple of times uh, just to make sure, and then patches again till it's dry. Then immediately, lightly oil the bore and the entire firearm. Because when that vinegar and ammonia is working, it's actually putting off a gas. And that will work into the areas around the uh, chamber, into the frame. And if you leave it setting on there, you're going to have a horrendous rust job on it. Oh, yeah. So once you've gone through and you've gotten the lead out, thoroughly, thoroughly clean the gun and wipe it down with oil inside, out, everywhere around it that you can get to. Hold that thought, Jim. We've got to top the hour break. We've got to top the hour break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned.
All right, we're back. Ladies and gentlemen, J.R. Moore here, our second hour on Monday, the 18th of September. Prepper tip of the day, I want to encourage all of you to have a what's called an automatic wristwatch. That's a wristwatch that does not have a battery. It will not be affected by EMP. Uh, there's a high likelihood that one with a battery will be affected by EMP. There's some choices there at my website under John's Survival and Tactical Gear at my website, thelibertyman.com. You might want to, you might want to check those out. We're visiting with Jimmy Jensling, the proprietor of Desert Eagle Shooters. That's deserteagleshooters.com. Talking about firearms and related matters. Got a question or comment about firearms or related matters? Give us a call at 800 800- 313-9443. That's, uh, that recipe of, of the vinegar and ammonia 50-50 is uh, something that could help a lot of people. But you're right, Jimmy, you need to be very careful with it because it's, it's very caustic and, and could cause great harm to uh, metal if allowed to remain on there, couldn't it? Oh, yes. And uh, especially since you're putting it in your bore, uh, if you... Do this, and I recommend that people that have handguns that shoot uh, regular and use cast bullets, well, actually, just lead bullets. A lot of manufacturers and everything uh, will sell just, like for the 45, 230-grain lead bullet for practice and everything. And over time, it will deposit that lead in there. And once a year unless, of course, you're a competition shooter and you're putting hundreds of rounds every day or every weekend through it more often. But at least once a year, go through and de-lead your barrels. And I have, I've even actually gotten to the uh, concept on a couple of them that were really, really bad uh, as far as the, the amount of lead and the crud and everything in the barrel that once I've done... Uh, de-leading it and everything and cleaned it, actually putting the plug back in and filling the bore with oil and let it set for a little while to get into all of those little creeks and crevices in the rifling. And just in case there's a, a piece of lead or copper or some other something in there that didn't get scrubbed out that could be hiding some of that ammonia vinegar mix that just fill it with oil, let it set for a while, and then do another cleaning on it. Because it's a very, very aggressive product, but once you've used it, it's a safe product as long as you remember to clean everything thoroughly. And if it's a lever gun or, uh, you know, bolt action or whatever that your uh, bolt or trigger mechanism on handguns, of course, um Run some oil down inside there. If you can disassemble it and you're familiar with disassembling your trigger group and everything, do it, oil it. Good time to look at it anyway and inspect it and then oil it and put it all back together. But another, another thing, another thing, Jimmy, to remember, if it's a gas-operated rifle, uh, there's going to be a, a hole in that barrel to siphon off uh, gas, and that, that, uh, that mixture is going to get into the uh, gas operating system of the rifle, too. That needs to be taken apart and cleaned also. Yes, sir. And um, now on your gas systems, uh, AR-10, uh, AR-15, with that, uh, several other models that have the gas tube on them. If you ever notice that your rifle is kind of sluggish in lock time, take and uh, the best I have found is carburetor and choke cleaner. Don't care what brand. It's called carbon choke cleaner. And take the plastic extension tube with that and stick that down into that gas tube and spray it all through there and let it come out into the barrel, let it set for a little bit and work, and then do it again, and that will knock 90% of any carbon and crud in there out. Uh, if you've done a cleaning job and de-leading on the barrel like we've discussed, uh, you've got that plug in there, and like I said on this last one, you know, fill the barrel with oil just to get into the cracks and crevices. That's getting into that gas port as well. And as long as you take your time and you clean it very, very well, you're going to notice two things. One, 
far better performance in your in your handgun or rifle, and you're going to notice that the accuracy has come back. So that that's something that you need to look at at least once a year, ladies and gentlemen, spring cleaning and uh, de-lead those barrels, and you'll really get back to where you're shooting. And this also, especially, John, is twenty two rifles. Um, I did a bore scope a while back on a guy's rifle because we were trying to figure out why it wouldn't stay on target. And about, well, I went in from the from the chamber in first, looked at the chamber and all of that, and then traveled up it with the bore scope. And there was a point there that the bore scope started getting a little bit uh, stiff going in, and I could see the gray streaks in the bore scope around it. So I pulled it out and went in from the muzzle end and only got about a half an inch in before it would go no further because of the lead buildup. Really? Amazing. And I asked the guy, I says, uh, when was the last time that you cleaned this? And just the expression on his face told me, never. Right, right. Um, so if you've got a twenty two rifle, ladies and gentlemen, that is kind of squirrely on accuracy and you haven't really deep cleaned it in a long time or if ever, you really need to do this before we have any uh, social economic upheaval or anything else because eventually it could cause the rifle to develop into a point of it being unsafe. Uh, At the very worst, being very, very inaccurate. So... But, yeah, John, I, I kind of forced it a little ways in there, and then when I eased it back out, there was just a little bit of lead hung up on that on the end of the bore scope on it. So I helped the guy clean that one, and it took four days. And no good. I, and right. I'm thinking somewhere between 20 or 25 applications of the ammonia vinegar mix to finally get all of that out of that barrel. And I, I assume that no one has ever cleaned that gun, and it uh, was part of his family. So it had come from his dad to his brother and then to him. So for I don't know how many years, but it had never been cleaned. So just food for thought, ladies and gentlemen, food for thought. That mirror... And a strong light will tell you all kinds of things about your board. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, a clean firearm will uh, be reliable and be accurate um, and serve you well. And, uh, yeah. And a uh, final tip on the cleaning part of it. When you're done cleaning and you're getting ready to oil it down and put it away, set it out in the sun and let it get warm, and I mean really warm. Everybody's left their rifle, you know, on the line when they're shooting at the range and everything in the sun and then come back and go to pick it up, and, oh, my God, it's hot. You want that because that opens up all the pores, and then when you run your oily patch through the bore and you're wiping down all the metal on the outside and everything else, those pores will take that oil in, and it will truly be a protector. Right. So. Right. That's good just, advice, just Jimmy. Yeah. Up on yeah. that one. Yeah. Uh, of course. Yeah. If if you're in a cold environment, you could uh, put it in a conventional oven at 150 degrees for a few minutes. That would that would uh, accomplish the same thing. Yes, and uh, then another thing that you can do um, doesn't matter if it's electric or gas water heater. You can always set it on top of the water heater. Uh, for a while and warm it up that way. Um, if you've got a gas furnace that powers your house, normally those things are in a configuration. You've got to be able to get in there to change filters and stuff. You could actually, if it's a rifle, just lean it up inside of the furnace compartment overnight and let it pull all that ambient heat from in there uh, or set it up on top of it. Uh, mind you, if it has a plastic stock or plastic grips on it and everything, remove them. Uh, 
or forego that particular one with the furnace. Otherwise, you might have a very unique custom stock when it's all over with. <laughs> uh, yep. And then be calling me and wanting to know, how come I'm so stupid? So right. just just food for thought, folks. A warm rifle or uh, handgun opening up that pores does a very, very great job of enhancing its, its uh, protectability of the oil by allowing it to get into the pores and penetrating a few thousandths or hundred thousandths of an inch into the uh, metal itself. So, let me see, what else? Uh, oh, new, uh, I got a new shooting exercise for everybody to break the, break the uh, boredom, John, whenever they go to the range. Okay. Um, this is for the rifle shooters now. Uh, get you a large piece of cardboard, uh, you know, go to, go by your appliance place and, and pick up a, uh, uh, washer or dryer or stove box or something where it's got those real nice three foot by three foot sides on it and take it to the range. And what you want to do is when you get into the prone position shooting, have someone measure how far off the ground the muzzle of your rifle is. And let's just take for arbitrary figure, let's say, 10 inches. So you take that box and you measure up 10 inches from the bottom and make that your center. And then you can make it oblong, you can make it square, you can make it round, but put a minimum of a inch hole in that uh, box with the uh, bottom third of the hole covering where your muzzle mark is on on the uh, box that you put on there. Then when you're out there practicing and everything, set that box up about 15 feet 20 feet between you and the target to where you can see the target through the hole and practice shooting at your targets through that hole without hitting the cardboard. Now, it's going to do two things in your education. One, it's going to educate you about where that bullet is on bullet flight or... Uh, the distance between the, your scope or your sights and the line of the bore on the rifle. And once you find, and if, if you keep hitting the box, move it in or move it out until every round is going through. And that will tell you, that will give you, with a measurement from your muzzle to it, it will give you a distance of where the first crossing point and line of sight and bullet flight is. Now, stick that back in your memory, because later on, uh, let's say there is truly a crap hit the fan event, and you and your neighbors and everything are setting up, and, and you're organizing, and you're running patrols to, to keep your block and your neighborhood safe. If you know that distance already, you can set up an observation and shooting position that will cover your street that so far away and you've got a hole where somebody outside can't see you, also known as a sniper's hide, and you can still see out, though, on it. So that way you can utilize concealment and cover and still cover your guys that are on patrol or... Uh, you know, you've got it covering the gate to the, the the community where you live or whatever. But it gives you protection from the bad guys, and it also allows you to, or whoever else, to cover their shooting positions and everything. By practicing, you get accustomed to doing it because it takes away a lot of your peripheral vision as far as what else is going on. 
So that's a little fun exercise to do at the range and uh, to break the boredom of just punching paper or shooting shotgun shells or whatever. So, well, uh, anything that makes it more interesting is certainly uh, warranted and we welcome there, Jimmy. And, yeah. you know, ladies and gentlemen, that the old saying goes that you shoot like you train and you train like you shoot. And if all the time that you're out there punching paper, great. That's that's keeping your trigger uh, control and sight picture and all of the other basics and everything in, uh, in check. But practice shooting from sitting down. Try practice sitting down on the ground. Uh, try anything that you can think of to make it different and more interesting because with new positions and uh, new shooting techniques, you're going to have to develop new uh, procedures hold, to overcome. Hold on. We have a break here. We'll be back. Stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, J.R. Moore here. It's taken three years before I could offer the inter-shelter domes for sale. During those three years, several different governments and militaries were taking all their production. The inter-shelter dome homes may be just what you've been looking for to provide affordable, energy-efficient, permanent, and attractive housing. These dome homes are prefabricated units that can be assembled in a few hours by two men with a ladder and simple hand tools. Check out the photos of these dome homes built in the Arctic on tropical beaches, in suburban areas, and in forests. All the details, many photographs, and the pricing of the dome homes are listed on the left-hand side of my homepage at thelibertyman.com. I think you'll find these homes are not only attractive, but they're energy efficient and a bonus. You can disassemble them and reassemble them as many times as you feel you need the need to. Pretty great, huh? Something that's very, very unique. Check them out at my website at thelibertyman.com. Jim, we're back. J.R. Moore here on Monday, the 18th of September, visiting with Jimmy Jensling with Desert Eagle Shooters. That's deserteagleshooters.com. Um, people can contact you through your website, can't they, Jimmy? Yes, sir. Uh, we've got the uh, contact page on there. Uh, actually, I think it's at the bottom of practically every page on the website at uh, deserteagleshooters.com. And also, they can just email me direct at J-I-M-I at H-D-C hyphen N-M dot com and that's uh, Juliet India Mike India at Hotel Delta Charlie hyphen New Mexico or uh, dot com so you know you can do it that way or if you've got to call me or something and have a question on that you can always give me a call uh, five seven five five one three two eight four two, and with your questions or uh, ideas or comments, uh, email us. Uh, give us some heads up on something you'd like us to cover, or a particular problem that uh, you may be having that we could research and maybe uh, help you find a solution for it. Because if you're having that problem, chances are somebody else is having that problem. And. Um, a little, little update right now, John, on the uh, Hearing Protection Act and the National Reciprocity. Please, um, please. Yes. The uh, Hearing Protection Act was tagged on to another bill. Um, don't have that one right in front of me right now. But uh, they're trying to work it through on 
some sort of game and fish uh, hunting land use bill uh, that Democrats approve of, and uh, they're hoping they can get it passed through that way without having anything stripped out or pork added. And the uh, national reciprocity. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Ryan told some of the new congressmen coming in and their staff that that was on hold and it was going to stay there until they needed it. 202-224-3121. I just I, I just messed myself up, John. Anyway, Capital Switchboard, call and talk to your congressman and your senators and tell them to get off their butts and get this passed. If they're up for election this time around and you don't like what they've been doing, inform them that you're working on finding someone to primary them and take them out and replace them because you're tired of them not listening to their constituents or the people. And the, you know, I had a Senator Heinrich, our own Heinrich here in New Mexico, in a conversation with his staff, I was bringing up some points about other laws and stuff, and the lady goes, well, Mr. Heinrich is more interested in New Mexico and blah, 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 blah. And I said, yes, ma'am, Mr. Heinrich is to represent his constituents, but any law that he votes on, whether it is New Mexico specific or not, is going to affect New Mexico. So pass my concerns on to him, and I would like to have a reply. Congressman Pierce's office, I have gotten updates and replies on numerous things that I've brought to his attention. I have never so much had a thank you for contacting me from Heinrich's office. He's a Democrat. So, ladies and gentlemen, get your congressmen and your senators. Tell them you need these bills passed. You don't want, you need them passed. Congress put in a uh, resolution that they were going to kind of fast-track national reciprocity, but they were going to do it a backdoor way that covered only congressmen and senators to be able to carry concealed uh, in Washington, D.C. with their state uh, concealed carry license. And, you know, we jumped on that as fast as we could. No, 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 no. Absolutely. Uh, take care of themselves. That's expected. Here's our break. Call numbers 800-313-9443. You are tuned in to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Visit our website by going to republicbroadcasting.org. Ladies and gentlemen, J.R. Moore here. I've worked with men and women involved in the high-end shelters for years. With the Ozark Survival Homesteads, you get things that you don't get with the high-end shelters. You get a opportunity to be in the bunker, of course. You also get a home, a 60 by 90 lot. You get your storable food, uh, your livestock share, your garden, greenhouse share, your seed bank share. One person to have everything they need right at $25,000. For a family of three, $37,000. You really need to check this out. It's very unique. At my website, you'll see the uh, Ozark Survival Homesteads on the left side of my home page. Go there, read that one page, fill out the form with your name, your email address, and your telephone number, and I will forward that to the guys and gals at the Ozark Survival Homesteads. Check it out. You'll be very glad you did. Thank you very much.
are back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back. J.R. Moore here on Monday, the 18th of September. A quick reminder, um, my friend, a fellow talk show host, uh, Republic Broadcasting, Tim Spencer, go under, uh, is going to surgery Thursday to have his left foot removed uh, between the ankle and the knee. The family has some unexpected expenses. If you want to help out, go to ruralsurvival.info. Scroll down the right side. There's a place where you can donate to help the Spencer family through this um, temporary crisis they're going through. Tim has a very positive attitude. I had lunch with him the other day. He's already researching the prosthesis that he'll pick out uh, to help with the, getting him back um, back into action full speed. At my website, thelibertyman.com, we have a project uh, where we're, listeners are finding images of continents with new coastlines in television shows. Movies, magazines, the list is long and growing. If you find one, get that to me as a thank you. You get your choice of any of my five DVDs as a thank you that I will ship to you at no charge. Also, my website, of course, are energy cleaners. I use mine every night. I'm pretty active around the ranch here, up and down ladders, up and uh, in and out of the swing pool doing work on the concrete, down on my knees doing concrete work, painting, carpenter work, plumbing. Go to, back, go to bed with minor aches and pains. Wake up pain-free the next morning. If you have joint pain, if you have arthritis pain, if you have uh, back pain, the energy cleaner will probably help. Not getting a great night's sleep? Yep, probably help there also. Keep in mind, I offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. I'm shipping two energy cleaners to Australia this morning. Be sure and check out the factory-made fitted mattress pads. Uh, these products are my home business. I'm the guy that packs them up and ships them out. I do that all on my own. Sometimes my wife helps me. Usually I'm on my own. Only $285 shipping included to American zip codes for the energy cleaner. I do take PayPal, MasterCard, Visa. Checks can be sent to my address at thelibertyman.com. Toll free our line here it is 800-592-9543. I say again, 800-592-9543. If you got a question or comment for Jimmy and myself, we're talking about farms and related items, related matters here at Republic Broadcasting. It's 800-313-9443. And, of course, Jimmy is with Desert Eagle Shooters. That's deserteagleshooters.com. And uh, let's continue, Jimmy. Okay. Um, something that I was just thinking about there when it went into the break and everything. Um, one of the discussions that we had this weekend, I demonstrated the wall drill a couple of times to a couple of people. And... Uh, gentleman was talking about he was having a hard time maintaining his his trigger control when he went shooting it would take him 10 or 15 minutes warming up to mentally get back to manipulating the trigger properly and in talking to him and everything i asked him if he happened to have an m1a uh trigger finger training tool and most everybody's out there and probably can see an expression on your face, John, that I'm not sure what an M1A trigger finger training tool is, but I guarantee you everybody's got one. <laughs> and I highly recommend it because you can train anytime, anywhere, doing anything. And what it is is a good ballpoint pen that clicks open and clicks close. Now, the technique that you use is... When you put your trigger finger on the button that operates your uh, ink pen, you push it down to open the you know, you know, to open the pen so you can write with it. You push it down gently and you feel the click when it just set the little lock mechanism to keep the pen pointed out. Now, if you gently let the pressure off just a hair and then push down again, you'll feel the click of when it reset to allow you to put the bar you know the pen back in the barrel All right about halfway up it's going to click again now if you think about it that is the same procedure when you fire your shot you hold it you know you hold the trigger back you take the mental snapshot as you're releasing the trigger on your rifle or your handgun especially some uh, in semi-automatics you're going to feel the trigger reset. So you're going to pull the trigger back, bang, and as you're easing your finger out, 
like you all good riflemen should do. You don't want to flip it off. You sit there and you come out and you hear that second click. That is the reset. That's as far as you need to go on letting the trigger out. Saves time if you're in, an, in, in a time competitive event or um, if, if you're doing a quick follow-up shot or anything, you've got it already set and ready to go. So the M1A trigger finger training tool, you take the pin and you click it down, you let it up, reset it, and then as you're coming up with it on there, train your finger that when it feels that click, stop. And then push the, the barrel back out. What you're doing is you're training your finger muscle memory as to recognize that trigger reset and stopping. So that, That's difficult to do with a thirty caliber rifle because there's so much recoil to, to be dealing with at the same time. Yeah. But, uh, you know, some of the thirty caliber rifle, like the M1 Garand, uh, it is such a heavy beast and so stable that still you should be holding that trigger back after you fire the shot and after the recoil's gone and everything, you start to ease it back out and feel that reset. Well, but, if, you do it after, if you do it after the recoil, yes, then you could definitely feel it, absolutely. Right. And uh, there are some pistols out there that are the same way on the semi-automatic pistols. After you fired the round and you start easing the trigger out, you'll feel the reset. But primarily we're looking at this on rifles. 1022 is an excellent training tool on this thing because it has such a distinct reset on it. And and you can actually hear the reset on, on the 1022. So if, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll, if you'll practice this, you could, like I said, you can do it anywhere. You could be in a business meeting, and they're giving the round count for the number of donuts sold in the last decade, and you're not really part of that conversation. You can sit there and gently work your finger and get that memory in. What we're doing, ladies and gentlemen, is we're training our bodies through this muscle memory that when we get ready to go into a firing position, we are almost perfectly in the firing position when we get there. When we go to sit down in prone position, we instinctively have angled our body. We get that elbow planted and get that knee up, get our diaphragm off the ground, and we do that without thinking. And if you can train your trigger finger to do the same thing, then you're not consciously waiting for that click to happen as soon as your finger feels that it stops. And it's a real simple technique, doesn't cost anything, and by practicing that whenever you can and wherever, I, I do it going down the road. When I'm driving to Albuquerque to the VA, there's a long stretch out there for about hour and 45 minutes of nothing, and I do mean nothing, God has got a sense of humor because on the road between Roswell and Vaughn, he put two trees. Right. And unfortunately, he put them side by side. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a boring drive, but it gives you something to work on. And so just thinking about your the, going back to basics, ladies and gentlemen, we go out to the range, we practice basics. Then we throw in a few new odd things to make it different. Uh, pick up some of those little, we ordered in some of those uh, swinging steel discs for a customer a while back. And uh, one of them was damaged in shipping. It actually, I don't know, if somebody dropped something on it or what, but the legs were bent. And I called the company and got a replacement sent under warranty and told them I'd box this one up and send it back. And they said, no, I don't need to. You know, you send us the pictures and everything. So I took it out and took a hammer to the legs and straightened out to where they would function again. And I stuck it down there at 50 yards. And it's amazing. I'll sit there and have people out here practicing and things like that. And they'll get bored and they'll go to those little swingers down there. And perfect 
their all their steady hold factors. And uh, a, a little one and a half inch uh, diameter steel circle, John, at fifty yards offhand, is a nice little challenge. That's a challenge, so absolutely. It will yeah. it will get your juices flowing, especially if somebody's uh, you know taunting you on the side. All right. All right. It would be a but, challenge. Uh, but, in, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we practice and we practice, but the thing is is we have to make our practice worthwhile. And most of us, all of us, can go out there and punch paper all day long. What we've got to do is start looking at it in real life. If you work in an office or something, you know, look at the situation around you and think, well, if something happened here, what would I do? My my desk offers me con, uh, concealment, but it's not cover, and this and that. Start just running different scenarios through your mind. Uh, if you've got a boring drive or you get one of those drives where you're stuck in traffic for time, uh, just run different scenarios through your mind, and next time you go to the range, practice some of those. Keep Keep yourself on your toes and keep challenging yourself to do better. And... Uh, what what's your favorite uh, training drill, John? That's not just out there just punching paper. Uh, well, uh, for, I mean, for rifles or for pistols? Uh, let's do rifles first. Okay. Well, uh, if I if I'm working with a student, I'll uh, I'll have targets set up at uh, steel plates, I should say, because they're more fun. Uh, 25, 50, 75, 100, 125. And um, I will. It depends on what kind of what we're trying to accomplish. But if we're trying to get them to react and, and uh, fire under stress, I'll have them start out with a empty magazine, and then when the when the whistle blows, load the magazine, load the magazine into the rifle, and then shoot at a target that I designate. They don't know which target I'm going to have them shoot until until they're all loaded up and ready to go. And only load only load, load one round because uh, uh, most of these students need lots of practice manipulating uh, these different controls, uh, loading the magazines, loading the magazine into the weapon, and uh, cycling the, the bolt and all that. So it's just a lot of repetition in that regard uh, to build in muscle memory for this uh, student to get used to loading uh, under pressure. Because I got a stopwatch going uh, at the same time, and and usually within a one hour period of time of this repetition, there's a noticeable improvement in the time it takes a student to load the magazine, load the magazine into the rifle, fire the ma- fire the rifle, and put the rifle back down. Um, noticeable improvement, and it's just a lot of fun. Yep, and uh, you brought up a good point on that. I was going to mention earlier and forgot. When you're at the range, ladies and gentlemen, and you're practicing, um, get out there and and do some jumping jacks. Do some running in place. Uh, do some twists. Uh, if you can, if it's open and you can do this without, you know, bothering anybody, jog about, you know, oh, 50 yards and turn around and jog back, and then go to the line, pick up your rifle, and engage your target. Well, if that's, that's done, cool. if that's done while the clock is running, that puts an even more pressure on the student to have to run away from the firing line, range, uh, firing line, uh, 20 or 30 yards, and run back while the clock is running. Otherwise, they're going to do a, a lazy little jaunt down and back. But if they know they're being timed, that uh, adds another whole level of uh, seriousness to it. Yeah, and what we're doing, ladies and gentlemen, is in doing that, you're going to duplicate to some extent, not exactly, but to some extent, what your body is going to feel like if you are in a critical shooting uh, situation. Because if you have to draw your weapon and the finger goes inside of that trigger guard, like John was explaining earlier, and puts a finger on that trigger, your heart's going to be pounding you're going to get, you know, clammy hands sometimes. You're going to be nervous. And by doing the little run technique, 
or running in place or whatever, what you're doing is you're getting your heart rate up, you're getting your body pumped up and running and everything, and then when you pick up that rifle and try to get your sight picture, you're going to see all of this manifested in your eyesight. And it, it's I've had guys that have done that, John, and they couldn't find the target with a search warrant. Right, right. Well, uh, another level of uh, seriousness would be to do what we did in Special Forces. If you fail to hit the steel plate, you have to eat a raw egg. Uh, well, that wouldn't bother me too much. I used to do that all the time when I was on swimming team. Uh, so, raw egg and oval team. But... Um, <laughs> yeah, you can you can do challenges like that to your buddies or your shooting partner you're out there with. Right. Uh, the one that can do that and hit the most targets, the most steals, um, you know, you're going to buy them a two-liter bottle of their favorite pop or whatever. Uh, just things, little, little challenges. What you're trying to do is break the ordinary. We all punch paper, but let's make punching paper a little more interesting. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at some of these steels that we carried. I mean, that one that I was talking about, John, it's got a inch and a half, a two, and a three-inch disc. And the whole thing, when it's all folded up, is roughly, I'd say, 10 by 12, maybe. Uh, and it just sticks into the ground. I think it costs like $28 or whatever. You can go out and get some of those, or you can make some of your own. Uh, any good chunk of steel will sit there and work for a reactive target you can hang it by a chain you can just lean it up against something uh, lots of different ways to do it but when you're shooting steels it's going to bring another aspect into this that you haven't dealt with and, and, and be sure it's hanging be sure it's hanging freely and not solid because it'll it'll just bounce that bullet right back at you otherwise that's what i was going to get to Okay. There is a Hold video. Oh, Here, right. here, here here's our break. gentlemen jr moore here on monday the 18th of september yes um make sure that this part's covered thoroughly because it, it literally could be a matter of life and death make sure these plates are hanging freely and not solid jimmy oh yeah and uh in your plates and everything if you're milling them yourself make sure that you if you're using chains or whatever and you will have them welded to the back or you weld them to the back or whatever that the bottom of the plate is slightly further back on uh, than the top of it, you know. That way, it is a reflect a uh, ricochet towards the dirt and nowhere else. It has to be able to be free moving and everything. There's a video online, and it's an old one, but it's a perfect example of what John and I are talking about. This guy is at a a uh, shooting range somewhere, might be a private range or whatever, but he's sitting at a, a bench, uh table set up out there on the range, and his buddy's videotaping it. And I can't remember if it's a steel plate, I mean a uh, steel pipe or I-beam or whatever at the far end, and the guy's going to shoot it with his new big bore gun. And he takes the shot, and the bullet takes his hat off. Oh, boy. It ricochets straight back, takes his hat off, and his buddy, you know, is like runs over with the camera still going. And, you all right? You all right? And the guy's, you know, kind of patting his head. And luck is nothing to do with it. God was watching out for this guy because there's yeah. just the slightest little crease in his skin but a beautiful bullet hole in his hat. Um, so, ladies well, and gentlemen, if you're shooting yeah. at steels, Make sure that they're free-moving and they're angled slightly. 
so that when the bullet hits, it will ricochet down into the ground. And also, if you're setting up your own range on that, make absolutely certain that there is nothing to the left or right of that steel that may be damaged. Because you may not hit the steel square on, you may hit the edge of it and cause the bullet to deflect, not so much ricochet, but deflect off to the left or right, whichever way you hit it. So steels are definitely fun, and they're an instant gratification on a hit. Right, right. Be no very, doubt. very careful with them and think ahead. No doubt. With paper, uh, when you once you get... Uh, out past 50 yards or so, you need a scope, and uh, to uh, which means you either stop what you're doing and use the scope yourself, or have a spotter tell you. Right, and now see that's another good one, John. Uh, when you go out and there's a couple of you going to shoot, do the spotter shooter technique. You're you're sitting there shooting, and say your wife's out there with you, she's right beside you, but there is a particular position that they need to be in or you need to be in when you're spotting for someone. If they're a right-handed shooter and they're shooting prone, the spotter ideally will be slightly behind them and just basically in line with the rifle and the target. That's right. And that way when they're with the binoculars or their spotting scope or anything, they're watching the same line of flight as the shooter sees. And then, Jimmy, we were out of time, sir. We were out of time. <laughs> we'll be back and we got to think about next week. So, ladies we and do. gentlemen, drop us a note. Tell us what you'd like uh, to talk about. Thank you. That's it for the day. Get your medical supplies, your energy cleaner, your essential oils now while you can, your firearms, ammunition. Never, ever give up your guns. Have a fun, safe, productive day. And God bless America. 